Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome and welcome and good morning to those who are watching later online. It may not be morning when you watch this, but good morning. Uh, enjoy. God bless. Uh, okay. Um, well, let me read a little bit of scripture. It's always a wonderful place to start. This is from 1 Chronicles chapter 29. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. You don't understand why I chose that scripture by the time I'm done. But I won't say it up front. Let's talk about prayer. We're going to go into a time of prayer here shortly. So I thought it would be useful to talk a little bit about what that looks like for you and for me. Uh, maybe start with a question. How many here <clears throat> have been in a time of prayer that you didn't want to leave? Okay. How many have been in a time of prayer that you weren't sure why you were there? <laughs> in other words, maybe I could leave now. <laughs> okay. Now. There's all kinds of approaches to prayer. I'm not trying to give a magic encompassing foundation for it. What I'm trying to do is just a couple of elements. Because here's my experience. I've been in both those places lots of times over many years. And I would say, like life in general, so many things in life, there's prayer and then there's prayer. In our experience, how it looks to God, we'll, we'll get to another time. But there's prayer and then there's prayer. It's just like there's hamburgers and there's Aussie burgers. <laughs> right? They're not the same thing. Okay. So, a long time ago, I started to reflect on this and think, so what is it that makes the one compared to the other? What are, what are the ingredients? What are the pieces? His presence. So the presence of God. And then it gets super interesting. So early on, I recognized the difference, but didn't know how to figure it out. Um, sometimes, if you get in one of those prayer meetings where you're not sure why you're there, one of the things you notice is awkwardness, right? It's uncomfortable. Um, and no one likes to feel uncomfortable. You want to go somewhere where you're comfortable. But if you're in those places where God is present, Comfort comes right there, and you don't want to leave. And you're not so much, well, we'll come back to that. You're not so much focused on how it works. It's just working. So um, you, know, you have those dynamic times, and then you have those other times you don't know what to do. So I have some just really basic suggestions about how this works, and then practical things that we can do to help. Um, so let me start point A with a, a byline for prayer that I like. I won't call it a definition, because I don't intend to sort of put it here and everything else isn't. Not at all. But it's one that I like and has helped me. A kind of suggestion, so I'll put it out to you, and that is this. Prayer is thinking God's thoughts after him. I'll say it again. Prayer is thinking God's thoughts after him. So let me unpack that a little bit. I've got five points here quickly that we can work with. So God's thoughts are what matter. So number one, if we're going to ask God for something, it's helpful, of course, to know what's within the range of what he's interested in and invested in. It's within the range of, you know, Scripture says, 
my thoughts, my ways are higher than yours. So we want to know it's in that ballpark. We don't have to have it necessarily nailed down to start, but we want to know it's in the realm of what God would respond to. Because we can have all kinds of thoughts, and they might not necessarily be God thoughts. And to take a simple example, we know, and then how we work with things in God. We know, for example, that God exacts vengeance. But it might not be ours to ask for. I'm not saying it isn't. But we need to figure out what his thoughts are. And by figure out, I don't really mean figure out. I'll get to that. It means to listen. <laughs> All right. So that's number one. The second piece I commented on, as soon as we start to think about prayer as thinking God's thoughts after him, we're acknowledging that his thoughts and ways are higher than ours. We start from a place of recognizing that how we imagine what's at stake when we go to pray isn't necessarily what he imagines. And actually, I love that in prayer. When we get, it's like going to a chiropractor. You think it's like this and you get straightened. Right? The kink comes out. You go, oh, oh. And then it gets easy. So part of prayer then, thinking God's thoughts after him, is learning his ways. What he's like. He already knows ours. Our life is to learn his. All right? That's number two. Number three, to think about prayer as thinking God's thoughts after him puts us, puts us in the place of asking and listening rather than telling God what to do. So it's a posture. It's a place. Prayer becomes a context in which we come into alignment. Again, think of the chiropractor. We come into alignment with what God wants. Number four, thinking God's thoughts after him, to use that phrase that I like, it reminds us that he already knows what's up before we ask. Jesus, of course, when he taught his disciples, he said, you don't need to go on and on to fill me in or fill the Father in heaven in on what the circumstances are. He knows. He knows. He doesn't need necessarily the big context or all the particulars. Usually there's some short, short sharp things we can do and there's some lovely models in scripture about how this works. God, you know that this is going on. Now, see, Lord. Act, Lord. All right, respond. Finally, number five. To think about thinking God's thoughts after him and that he understands everything in advance, it keeps us from begging. You ever done begging prayers? So, so here's a question for you. When you're in a begging posture, what level is your faith at? Not good. It's about like this. Because if your faith is high, of course our faith is in who God is and how good he is and how much he cares for us, the authority that he has, the power that he has, that he's for us, not against us. And when all those things are active in us, we don't need to beg. We can be insistent, because Scripture teaches us, not to stop, always pray, never give up. Pray unceasingly. But exactly what pray unceasingly means, we would have to you know, take other time to do. But we don't need to beg. So why would we beg someone who has all authority and is committed to us to do something if you understand already, you know what he's like and that he's listening and what he thinks and he wants to do it. So you don't have to beg. Uh, scripture sort of puts it in a picture of reminding God 
because we need to be reminded ourselves. Now, this is the scriptures. Lord, don't forget. Remember, O oh Lord, your promises. And it's not as though God has forgotten them. But the prayer is, come back to those promises. It's an ask that it happen now or soon. But it's the reminder for us. And scripture is full of, for us, Remember, remember, remember. It's Moses' instruction to the people. And if you look at um, the Psalms, much of the praise in the Old Testament is anchored in what God has already done. And if you anchor yourself there, it gets easy to pray. So, to sum it up, when prayer works, at least for me, it involves, and this comes to Shirley's point, it involves a shift parallel to the one I've talked about before here. We've talked about it in the context of worship and the prophetic. It's the shift from self-consciousness to God-consciousness. That again is a marker of the place where I want to stay. When you're in a room of people and we're all self-conscious and we don't know what to do, that's when it's like, why am I here? When I'm in a room of people and we're God-conscious, and we're interacting with heaven, let's stay. That's where life is. In that place, we know we're praying according to God's will, and we know that God's will is unconquerable. That's a life-giving and also a very fun place to pray in. So that's all of point A. Point B, I can be really brief. It's this. And you can guess what's coming. If the shift is from self-consciousness to God-consciousness, the key to that, in my understanding and experience, is to start to praise God for who He is. Just start to praise Him for who He is. It takes the focus off me and you. It opens our hearts something else going on there and it comes back to this alignment issue when we tell God who he is praise whether we speak it we sing it maybe we dance it what we're doing is coming into alignment with the truth if everything everything else is false this is true God you are great you are good you're merciful, you're compassionate, you're loving, you're kind. So what it does is basically when we start to praise like that, bring us into that phrase of right relationship with God. We line up. Heaven, and in fact, heaven comes to earth at that point. When heaven comes to earth, we come back to Shirley's point. God is present. And I make it sound really simple, but I think it is. I actually think it is. When we on earth align with heaven, with what's true, and we bow down to his will, you know what the word worship means? Anyone? What it comes from? Because in scripture, so many of these are from pictures. There's actually two meanings, but one is to do this. It's the historic bowing down before someone who's greater. Royalty. Authority. Authority in this case before God, the other meaning that the term gets translated in English as worship is to serve. And they're connected, needless to say. You bow down to someone, acknowledge them as higher, you serve their will, not your own. So when that happens, the Holy Spirit shows up. I realize the term is casual, shows up. What it means is, the Holy Spirit, who is the spirit of truth, lives in truth, and therefore, guess what? When we get in truth, between heaven and earth, Holy Spirit is here. And I don't just mean that abstractly. We know it concretely. We're aware. It's like Janice last week, right? When we spoke the words of heaven, she, 
was a wonderful reminder to me. We went through phases where the tangible tingling or heat or something of God was on us when the Spirit was present. So it's not just the Spirit is here abstractly, but very, very much alive in us. So here's what we can do then, and this is what I would suggest we do. Bill, when you start today, <coughs> so that we can practice a little bit of this. And what we used to do all the time, and I've got a buddy that I pray with from time to time like this, we just start to worship God. And here's how simple it is. All you have to do, and this is what I would encourage, um, once Bill's outlined, you know, where you're going to focus, then just come back and go, we just open it to, Lord, thank you so much because... Lord, you are kind and compassionate. It's not formula, it's true. Let it come from the heart. We've talked about heart the last couple of weeks. Let it come from the heart. Just What is it that stirs in you about your affection and appreciation and thankfulness to Jesus? The atmosphere will change. Then as we start to ask for things, we know that we're asking because it's his heart. Now we have it up here most of the time. But to translate it into the room is to speak it out. Thank you, Jesus. We've done this with different scriptures. I was going to bring scriptures today, but then I just felt the Lord said, no, that's just each of us. It just needs to be a phrase as we start. So, Bill, I'll let you take over. and say, I'm happy to help with that, but I think it's just a matter of just opening and say, Jesus, I love you because, or Father, thank you so much for, or God, you are. You are so kind. You are so kind. There's no one as kind as you.